we are live. So keep your keep your gossip down. <laughs> All right. So we've got uh, Judges 19 is where we're at today. Do you remember some numbers I asked you to remember last week? Do you remember what they were? 200, 600, 600 900. 900. All right. <laughs> so we got that. We'll, we'll, we'll save the 900 up here. And the 900, do you remember where that came from? It was left over. Remember she had the 1,100 pieces of silver. And she spent 200, right, on the, the ephod the, or the idol, right? And, and so that 900 and that 200, right, together make 1,100. Um, but this is really the, the piece that is going to, like, pop up again. Okay, uh, and it's it's the fact that it's not mentioned. You know, where'd that 900, oh, 900 pieces of silver go? You know, where'd that nine hundred pieces of silver go? Uh, but we mentioned uh, briefly that numbers in the book of Judges is, uh, you know, you could have easily could, the author could have easily told the story, and you would have gotten the story without all the numbers. He could have said. He tied some torches to a bunch of foxes. But he tells you specifically 300 foxes. He could have said, God whittled Gideon's army down, you know, to, to just, just a few hundred men. But he said specifically there were 300 torchbearers. And the fact that there are 300 torchbearers and then another 300 torchbearers, that's not an accident. Okay, and what the, the author's trying to do is he's trying to tie this prologue, which is, it's the epilogue, but it's actually prologue, okay, it happened before all of this stuff. Um, he's trying to bring it all back together for us and show us something significant, okay. Um, three different times throughout the book of Judges, there are 600 men mentioned. There are 600 Philistines slain in Judges 3. There are 600 warlike Danites. They remember they they stand there and they steal that guy's idol and run off with his priest, you know. And he chases them down. He's like, "Hey, what are you doing?" And they're like, you know, they just threaten him. And he goes home because, well, I can't fight 600 warriors. And then we're going to find another 600 uh, in chapter 20. Um, six different sums of 1,100 shekels of silver. Uh, in Judges 16, 5, and 17, 2. Remember, there were five Philistine lords that were going to give her 1,100 apiece. And then we have this lady, this widow, who has 1,100 shekels stolen by her son, who then she then curses, and then he gives it back, and then she gives him some money to build an idol with. Okay? So again, not, the numbers are not pertinent to the narrative, you know, that we can get the gist of the story without all the numbers. So why all the numbers and why the same numbers over and over again? And I'm not suggesting to you that, you know, like some people are like, oh, 13, that's an unlucky number. You know, that's, that's really not what the author, I don't believe, is trying to get across. He's not trying to say 1,100 if you ever see that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's, that's not his point, okay? Um, but the number 11 shows up in the book of Judges. Anybody want to guess how many times? 11. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> so we have Joshua lives um, in Judges 2.8 uh, for 110 years. And you're like, well, that's not 11. Well, it's a, it's a multiple of 11. 11 times 10. Gideon's first army consists of 11 men. It's Gideon and his 10 servants go and cut down the altar of Baal, right? There's 11 men. Gideon later dismisses 22,000 men, which is 11 times 2,000, a much bigger army. Gideon brutalizes the 77 elders in Sukkoth. That's 11 times 7. Jer judges Israel for 22 yeah. years. Uh, Samson is outfoxed. Uh, on the 11th day of his challenge to the Philistines. And that's one that you wouldn't know unless you counted it up. But it was on the 11th day that he was, he was uh, duped. Oh, Delilah is bribed with the 1,100 pieces of silver. Micah 
uh, puts 1,100 pieces of silver to bad use. Uh, he's visited by uh, the, it's, it's 600 warriors, but there were also in that same story 605, which is 11 by 11 by 5. And 11 tribes gather at Shiloh in the book's gruesome climax. We're about to read that. Um, a body is uh, divided up and sent to the 12 tribes, but only 11 of them respond. Okay, uh, 22,000 Israelites are slain in the first battle. And you're like, well, that's just a lot of fancy math. Well, I'm, I will admit to you that I'm not a math person, but when you have multiples 11 showing up 11 times, specifically throughout scripture. In other words, the author's like, how many were there? Well, 11 times what? You know, it's like the, the number that's added, that's multiplied to the 11, that's the part that really doesn't matter all that much. The 11 is what matters. Um, and what does the 11 mean uh, to us? What's that have to do with our lives as Christians? Well, we'll get to that. Um, but it is, there's something deeply inappropriate, right, about associating Israel with the number 11. Because how many tribes are there? How many disciples are there? Wow. How many apostles are there? So 11 is not a good number when you're thinking of Israel, okay? And, and so we, we, we realize something's off. It's not right. And yet the author of Judges is constantly saying, guys, this is bad. There are 11s everywhere, okay? There are 11s everywhere. And, and this is a bad sign. So, um, but again, it's not like 11 is an unlucky number. It's not like we should live our lives like that. That would be an inappropriate application <laughs> of noticing the number 11 in the scripture. We don't be like, oh, well, you can't have 11 tulip bulbs, then your garden will, you know, die. Well, that's just silly, okay? Um, that's, that's not what he's trying to teach us. He's like, no, that number 11 means something more important, and it's about your heart. So the proper number of Israel is not 11, but it's 12. Proper number of apostles. You know, they were like, oh, well, Judas, you know, he went, over, you know, and betrayed. So we gotta, we gotta draw straw. They drew straws. <laughs> they cast lots to figure out who should be the twelfth apostle, and it landed on a guy named Matthias. Remember that story in the Book of Acts? Uh, but then, of course, God sent Paul, because that was God's choice to be the twelfth apostle. Uh, not he's like, you're, you're drawing straws <laughs> to see who should be the the twelfth apostle. As such, the numbers employed in the book of Judges are intended to reflect a situation in Israel, not uh, an unlucky number, okay? Um, the curious lack, you know, you have the beginning of the book of Judges where uh, it talks about Joshua and, and what they were about to do. Then you have the body, the main body of the book of Judges, uh, and then the, the prologue. But throughout the main body of all the stories of these Judges, Remember us talking about where these judges came from, what tribes they came from? We had some that came from Dan, some that came from Manasseh, some that came from Ephraim. None of the spiritual leaders of Israel came from the tribe of Levi. None of them. Yet, who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of Israel? The Levites. The Levites, right? The Levites are supposed to be leading the, the Israelites to God. Yet, Instead, what we're going to learn today is the one Levite who finally shows up in the story leads Israel to a civil war and some of the worst, I mean, I think probably the worst story in the Bible next to the crucifixion, which is actually the best story in the Bible, right? But this is so, this is the worst story in the Bible. And, and as far as dark things that took place in the name of God even, okay? Because this is this is what they were doing, and so the one Levi shows up, and uh, or Levite shows up, and this is what happens. Um, and so we have uh, this story in chapter 19. So we'll get into it. And uh, it says, in those days, there was no king of Israel. Remember that was like uh, meant to be the the tag on to what had just happened before it. Uh, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim. He took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judea, or Judah, and his concubine was unfaithful to him, and she 
uh, went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah. Now some versions, my ESV reads unfaithful, some versions just say she became angry with him, like they had a fight. And so we don't really know exactly why they split up. It could have been her unfaithfulness. Uh, that might be an input from somebody who just was didn't care for women. I don't know. But uh, the fact that he, this, this Levite, who you'll later discover, really doesn't have any moral scruples whatsoever, okay? Um, yet he goes back to get her. He doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who would go back and retrieve an unfaithful bride. Uh, he goes back to get her, I think because he was in love with her. Uh, and but she's gone back to daddy's house okay she's left and she's gone back home to be with her father um, and even under Hebrew law she would not have been able allowed to do that if she had been unfaithful okay uh, if the wife was unfaithful what was supposed to happen to her anybody remember kill him. You yeah kill you him. kill him <laughs> the men got off scot-free yeah. but the women got killed so I don't believe that that is maybe the most accurate translation and you know like i say other versions of the of the scriptures say that she became angry uh, but anyway she goes back home to her father um, and then what's how many months there in verse two what's four. your bible say four. okay four so every time we see a number we're going to highlight it <laughs> all right but so what we're about to see here is a countdown of sorts okay countdown to sorrow Let's just put it that way. So, four months. Which is a long period of time, right? Um, four months that uh, she was uh, there. Uh, and she went away to be with her, with her father. Um, and she was there for four months. And then verse 3. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys, and she brought him into her father's house. And with the girl's father saw him, he came out with joy to meet him. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him, how many days? Three, Three days. All right, shorter amount of time, Right? Four. Three. All right. What's the next number we should find? <laughs> so it says, and on the fourth day, they arose early in the morning, uh, and he prepared to go, but the, the girl's father said to his son-in-law, strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread. Now, if he had left that morning after the third day, if he had left, the story would have gone different, okay? But the father-in-law begs him to stay longer, right? So he says, stay longer, come and, and, and eat. Strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, and after that, you can go. So the two of them sat and ate and drank together, and the girl's father said to him, be pleased to spend the night and let your heart be merry. And when the man rose up to go, his father-in-law pressed him until to spend the night there again. And on the fifth day, he rose early in the morning to depart. And the girl's father said, strengthen your heart and wait until the day declines. So they ate, both of them. And when the man and his concubine and his servant rose up to depart, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, behold, now the day has waned toward evening. Please spend the night. Behold, the day draws to its close. Lodge here and let your heart be merry. And tomorrow you shall arise early in the morning for your journey and go home. And again, if he had gotten up early in the morning any of these days, he could have gone home. But the man would not spend the night. He rose up and he departed and arrived opposite of Jebus, which is Jerusalem. But at this time, it was still occupied by the Jebusites. Okay. Uh, and now you share it like, well, David, weren't there some more days in there? You know? uh, it was on the third day when he intended to leave. And he stayed for how many more extra days? At least two more days he stayed okay because it was on the fifth day i've lost it now verse eight he rose early 
in the morning to depart. And then the father asked him, please stay, stay the night, lodge, and you can go tomorrow morning on the sixth day. But in verse 10, he doesn't. He leaves at what time? On the fifth day. In nighttime, right? At least afternoon, okay? At least in the afternoon. So he has this journey to make uh, back home, which uh, he's going back to his place, which is going to be north of Jerusalem, but right now they're <coughs> south of Jerusalem, okay? And so they're headed north because she was from uh, Bethlehem, if you remember, uh, a lot of New Testament stories take place in Bethlehem. So she lives in Bethlehem. So they're in Bethlehem and they're walking north uh, to get back to his hometown, which takes them by way of Jerusalem. Uh, and he had uh, with him a, a couple of saddled donkeys and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was nearly over. And the servant said to his master, come now, let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites. So the ser servant wants to go where? Into Jerusalem, right? And spend the night there. And his master said, we will not turn aside into the city of foreigners. Okay, so he has this low opinion of the Jebusites, uh, who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. All right, so Gibeah was a town in the tribe of Benjamin that was actually deeded over to the uh, the Levites. So it was a Levite town, but it was populated by Benjamites, if that makes sense. Uh, so the Levites were allowed to live there. They were allowed to have land there and farm. Uh, and so it was a town that was meant to be uh, a town that was uh, led by the tribe of Levi. So it should have been a town, look at it this way, it should have been a town with a good local church, okay? <laughs> But it doesn't have one, <laughs> all right? It's just a, populated by a bunch of Benjamites. And he said to this young man, come, let us draw near to one of these places. So he makes this point of saying one. Let's draw near to one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they have a choice. You can go to Gibeah, which means the hill, or Ramah, okay? And Rama, I'm not too clear on what it means exactly, uh, but Rama or Rama usually means like a spoken word, okay? And so they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah. So they didn't have enough time to make it home, but if, if he had left early in the morning, they'd have been home by supper, right? But they didn't have enough time to make it home, so they had to stop overnight at Gibeah which belongs to Benjamin. And they turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. So we have this, this countdown of numbers. And you're like, well, that was a stretch, Pastor David, that you get this <laughs> countdown of numbers. Um, and, and maybe so, you know, you could, you could do that. But the same uh, countdown takes place in uh, chapter 9 of Judges, where Abimelech, do you remember his story? He divides his men into four companies in verse 34. He approaches Shechem and divides them into three companies in verse 43. And next, he divides them into two companies uh, and he launches an attack on Shechem. And finally, he is mercifully slain, and the scriptures specifically say, by one woman, verse 53. And it ends in Abimelech's death, right? Four, three, two, one, boom, he's dead. Well, we've just seen another countdown, and so somebody's about to die, and not in a good kind of way. A lot of times when we see death coming in the Old Testament, we're looking for a resurrection as well, right? But when you start to see a countdown like this in the book of Judges, it's not good, okay? There's a death is about to take place, and it's not a good one, okay? Um, and so we'll read what happens here. And again, this is where the story gets really, really bad. Okay, um, they're, they're at Gibeah, and the sun goes down on them. Um, verse 15, they turned aside there to go in to spend the night at Gibeah. And he went in and sat down in an open square of the city, for no one took him into his house to spend the night. Again, the law of Moses says to do what? When a stranger is in your city, what do you do? 
you're hospitable. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was not a secret law, <laughs> you know, as part of their culture. Even today, if you're in the Middle East, even people who are, are not believers, you know, they're just because of their culture. The Middle East, even if you're their enemy, they're bound by their culture to be hospitable to you. If you come and ask for a place to stay and food, they have to feed you and clothe you and give you shelter. Now, they may kill you in the morning, but <laughs> the first thing they're going to do is give you a place to stay and a meal, and they're going to show hospitality. Um, and so, behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim. So he's kind of from the same neck of the woods as the Levite. And he was sojourning in Gibeah. The men of the place were Benjamites. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going and where do you come from? And he said to him, we are passing from Bethlehem and Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to the house of the Lord. Was he actually going to the house of the Lord? Mm -hmm. huh. Well, the fake house of the Lord, remember? Yeah. The Danites, and they stole him, they kidnapped him and all of his idols. So he's not really going to the house of the Lord, is he? Uh, but no one has taken me into his house. Verse 19. We have straw and feed for our donkeys with bread and wine for me and your female servant and the young man with your servants. There is no lack of anything. And the old man said, peace be to you. I will care for all your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. So he is begging this guy not to sleep in the square. Okay, please come and stay at my house. So there's one man who happens to come from Ephraim who is showing hospitality to them. And not only that, he's like, I've got, we've got bread and wine. We're going to have a good time. And uh, we're going to take care of your animals too. So we brought him, verse 21, into his house and gave the donkeys feed. And they washed their feet and ate and drank. So they're having uh, communion. <laughs> he washed their feet and they ate and they drank. This old man who is being kind to them. Uh, verse 22. As they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. Now, this was not because they wanted to sit down and have a conversation. Okay, This is biblical code for we want to have our way with this man. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, now this is where things start to get a little dicey, especially, you know, it's like if you were to be in this situation yourself, in the very least, what you would do is you'd bar the door, right? Mm -hmm. That is not what these guys do. No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let that sink in, <laughs> okay? Don't do what you intend to do to this man. He is my guest. Here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing. What to you, now I, I know, it's a different culture, <laughs> it's a different time, but in all honesty, what to you seems more vile? They sacrificed those women for her. Yeah, they're like, that here, creepy old man. Yeah. have your way with these ladies, but don't do this vile thing. Okay? But so it is vile. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I don't think the scriptures are trying to sugarcoat it for you. Mm -hmm. Now, we... Uh, and, and I think in the past, the church has translated this and, and, and just sort of, not translated, but uh, interpreted this in, in a way to say, um, look, this is, this, is what, this is God's word, and therefore, you know, and it leads to this patriarchal, you know, err, and, 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 and not that, you know, I think the scriptures are clear about 
the roles of, of men and women, especially in the beginning when you read the Genesis account. God's very particular about some things. The law of Moses is particular about some things. Uh, but what, we, what do we see Jesus doing? You know, and again, I've said this before. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus, who was 100% fully God and fully man. Right. So what, is, what do we see Jesus doing with women who are caught in adultery? He's kind to them for one thing. He's kind to and he them sets them free, yeah. right? He sets them free. And, and kindness as well, right? But also he sets them free. The woman at the well, you know, mm -hmm. who he was not supposed to talk to. She was not Jewish. But he specifically goes there to talk to her and set her free from her sin, right? And so it's like, how does Jesus treat women? Oh, with respect, with respect and honor, uh, and and he he looks out for him because no one else is <laughs> in a way, right? He looks out for him, and yet here we have this sort of pseudo religious notion of hey 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 no 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 what you're doing is nasty. Here, take these women. You know, and it's like you have to if Jesus <laughs> were watching, which I believe he was. What was he thinking about that situation? Man up and go out there. If you're going to go outside, you go out there to take it yourself. You don't offer up another for your place, right? And that's what Jesus did, isn't it? He went out there and took it himself. He didn't ask the disciples to go to the cross for him. He went to the cross and said, now do likewise. Okay? So, and the, the master uh, of the house... Uh, offers the, the female servant and the concubine and says, uh, have your way with them. Do what seems good to you, but against this man do not do this outrageous thing. Verse 25, but the men would not listen to him, so the men seized his concubine, the man, uh, the, the Levite, seized his concubine and made her go out to them. And they knew her, and they abused her all night until the morning. Mm -hmm. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. And her master rose up in the morning, and when he opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine laying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Did you see this image? <laughs> Who died to save him? She did. And where is her blood spilled? Uh, on the doorposts, uh, on the threshold of the door. So let that not be wasted on you. I think it was wasted on the Levites and the tribe of Israel, <laughs> but don't let that be wasted on you. This woman, this woman is the Christ figure in this story. We don't often see that, but in this story, the woman is the Christ figure. She dies. For everyone else to save them but what's he do hey get up <laughs> he's not even clued in that she is expired there's no answer so he picks her up and put her on the donkey so he carries her the man rose up and went away to his home and then he entered his house took a knife and taking hold of his concubine he divided her limb by limb into 12 pieces and sent her throughout all the territories of Israel. So in this story, you know, don't let that, don't let your brain get caught, you know, hung up on the fact that it's a woman. I mean, that God doesn't care who it is or what gender you are if you're the one that's going to be used as the. And I believe this story is He's going to honor her in that way. She is one of these people. When we get to the kingdom of heaven, she'll be there. And he's like, yep, this is, this is one of my servants. This is one of my martyrs. And, and if you read in the book of Revelation, and if you know anything about martyrs, they have a special place in God's heart. Mm -hmm. That they're, they're, they're kept <laughs> underneath the altar. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's just like this special place that God <coughs> keeps them. And so here she is cut limb from limb into 12 pieces and sent throughout Israel. And all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day and the people of Israel 
came up out of the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak. So what do they what do they decide to do there in verse 30 when they're all you see got that scene in the movies where he sends them the, the horse head? <laughs> you know, that's kind of the same idea. Oh, oh got a delivery for you. It's an arm. You know, and here's the story that goes with it. So they saw it, but what do they do? What did, what do you do every other time something bad happens to them? What do they do? They go and inquire of the Lord, right? Now, eventually, they do their religious thing in here, but that's not what it says here. It says, consider this and take counsel and speak. That means you guys get together and figure out what we should do, okay? They don't turn to the Lord for wisdom. They turn to the Lord only when their necks are at risk, okay? Uh, which they do later on in here, too. Only when they're worried about if they're going to win a battle or not. That's the only time they pray. Uh, but such a thing has not happened in Israel uh, since the land uh, from the land of Egypt until this day. So since they left Egypt, nothing this bad has ever been done in Israel. And I would venture to say, uh, in a long time since then, nothing this bad. That is, in my opinion, the worst story in the Bible. What happens to this woman? And it's not even just what the tribe of Benjamin does to her. It's what the men who were supposed to be protecting her, did to her. You know, not what they allowed, what they did with their actions caused her death, okay? Horrible death. And, and yet, uh, they all shift the blame uh, to Benjamin. Now, is Benjamin to blame? Absolutely. But who else is to blame? <laughs> that man and that Levite are to blame. But let's listen to how the Levite tells the story. Now, we've got the story. We know how it went down. But how does the Levite tell the story? In verse 20. And all the people of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba, including the land of Gilead. And the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mizpah. And the chiefs of all the people of all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of people of God. 400,000 men on foot that drew the sword. 400,000, another number, right? Could he have just said a multitude, right? So he tells you a number for a reason. 400,000 men on foot that drew the sword. Now the people of Benjamin heard that the people of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. So how many tribes showed up? That's where we get the number 11 again. Only 11 showed up. Benjamin didn't show up. Uh, and who should have been taking care of the men at Gibeah? Their own tribe. Benjamin should have gone and dealt with that in-house. But they didn't even go to Mizpah. When they got their body part, they were like, huh. Okay? They didn't go to Mizpah to figure out what they should do. They didn't show at all. But they heard that all the 11 other tribes showed up. <laughs> okay? And the people of Israel said, tell us, how did this evil happen? So here's the Levite's uh, accounting of the tale. The Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came to Gibeah that belongs to Benjamin and I and my concubine to spend the night. And the leaders of Gibeah rose against me and surrounded the house against me by night. They meant to kill me and they violated my concubine and she is dead. Isn't it curious what he left out of the story? Yeah, yeah. He paints himself in pretty good light mm -hmm. to the tribes of his, to 400, wouldn't you? To 400,000 men who were up in arms about the injustice of what happened to this woman. If he had said, okay, so what happened was they wanted me, but I shoved her out the door instead and they killed her. Now he still may have gotten away with it, but it would have painted him in a whole different light. And then you might not have had quite as many men go down to Gibeah, <laughs> okay? You might have had some men say, oh, well, that's a different story, <laughs> okay? Um, so he leaves some pertinent details out of his story. So he doesn't lead the Israel to the truth. He's the one Levite that shows up, right, in the whole book. And yet he doesn't lead Israel to the truth. He leads Israel with lies. He leads Israel with half-truths. So I took hold of my concubine and I cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel 
for they have committed abomination and outrage in Israel. Behold, you people of Israel, all of you, give your advice and counsel here. Again, this is the Levite. We should have said, now let me pray. And let's see what we're supposed to do. Let's ask God. But he says, what do you guys think we should do? Okay. And all the people arose as one man, saying, none of us will go into his tent, and none of us will return to his house. But now this is what we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot, and we will take ten men of hundred throughout all of the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand, and a thousand of ten thousand, to bring provisions for the people. And when they come, they may repay Gibeah for, uh, repay Gibeah of Benjamin for all the outrage that they have committed in Israel. So all the men of Israel gathered against the city, united as one man. So we have some big numbers in there, right? We've got the, the 400,000 that are gathered, and they're going to take 10 men of 100 throughout all the tribes of Israel, and 100,000 and 1,000 of 10,000 to bring provisions. So they're mounting a large campaign, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, going, they're marching to war. But they're going as how many men? One. They're of one mind, one goal, one purpose, and that is to destroy Gibeah. And the tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What evil is this that has taken place among you? Now therefore give up the men, the worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and purge evil from Israel. Now if you think back to the book of Joshua, there was another time when there was evil in the camp, and they got in trouble for it. There was a guy named Achan, who when they uh, were supposed to go into Jericho, and destroy Jericho and destroy everything, Achan found some treasure. And he took it, even though he wasn't supposed to. And he hid it and he buried it in the floor of his tent. And there, they went to the city of Ai, Ai, uh, and they were defeated. It was the first time Israel had ever faced defeat in battle. And Joshua's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> God sent us in there. And yet we got slaughtered. What's going on? We have some good men died today because there's sin in the camp. Where, where is it? And so they figured it out and they narrowed it down to one tribe, narrowed it down to one clan, one, narrowed it down to one family. And then like, who is it? And Aiken's like, it's me. <laughs> and so he comes out. He's like, I did what was evil. And he, was, he had some integrity. He said, I, I was wrong and I deserve to be uh, put to death. For this and he is he's put to death for it he and his family okay and so they're put to death for it and that that sin and so this happens again that we need to this is bad stuff you know uh that we need to get out of israel we need to purge israel of this but the benjamites would not listen to the voice of their brothers and the people of israel then the people of Benjamin came together out of the cities to Gibeah to go out to battle against the people of Israel. So the whole tribe of Benjamin has come out to fight the rest of the nation. All right. So we have civil war. That's where the Levites have, uh, this Levite, this one Levite has led Israel. And the people of Benjamin mustered out of their cities on that day 26,000 men. Dun, dun, dun. It seems like a no contest, right? 400,000 against 26,000 should be easy peasy. Should be easy peasy. Uh, but we'll discover that it's not. It's not easy peasy. So um, they drew the sword besides the inhabitants of Gibeah. So Gibeah. Uh, mustered 700 chosen men. Among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Mm -hmm. And the men of Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All of these were men of war. So 700 from Gibeah. 
I know, the numbers are getting hard. We've got more than one up there, and they're all big numbers. Makes my brain hurt already, and I've not even looked at them yet. So we have um, these amazing men of war come out to the battlefield. Verse 18, the people of Israel arose and went up to Bethel and inquired of God, who shall go up first for us to fight against the people? This is the very first time they ask God what his opinion is. Who does he say to send first? Yeah. What does Judah mean? Do you remember what Judah means? Praise. Judah is always sent into battle first because the very first thing you need to do is get your heart right with God. Your hearts and your minds need to be focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Not your own power, not your chariots, not your horses, not the number of soldiers you have, not whether they're skilled enough to kill a hare with a sling, but have you done your devotions today? That should be job number one, okay? That should be job number one. So the very first time they ask God anything is who, who should go in first to fight? And he says, have you prayed about this yet? <laughs> okay. okay. Send Judah first. Judah shall go up first. Then the people of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to fight against Benjamin. And the men of Israel uh, drew up the battle line against uh, them at Gibeah. The people of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and destroyed on that day 22,000 men of Israelites. Wow, so 22,000 men. <laughs> Minus 22,000, wow. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of dead Israelites. When they outnumbered them, right? Severely. But the people, the men of Israel, took courage and again formed a battle line at that same place where they had formed it on the first day. So this is the second day. And the people of Israel went up and went bef wept before the Lord until evening. And they inquired of the Lord, Shall we again draw near to fight against our brothers, the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Go up against them. So the people of Israel came near against the people of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went out again and about uh, against them in Gibeah the second day and destroyed 18,000. I know the people on the video can't see my scribbly letters, but that's all right. I apologize. I wrote the number 18,000. Um, so 18,000 men died on the second day. Then all the people of Israel, the whole army went up and came to Bethel and wept. And they sat there before the Lord and fasted the day until evening and offering uh, burnt offerings um, and peace offerings before the Lord. And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministered before it in those days. So who's, if this is Phinehas and Eleazar, this is another reason why we date this as prologue before the book of Judges, uh, before all the rest of those stories. Because those stories happen over decades and decades, whereas uh, Phinehas and Eleazar would have been right after Aaron and Moses, okay? And so this is early on, uh, before the book of Judges, when this story takes place. It says, shall we go out once more to battle against our brothers, the people of Benjamin, or shall we cease? And the Lord said, go up for tomorrow, I will give them into your hand. So uh, Israel sets an ambush. Okay, so we have here these, these numbers. Um, how many Israelites die altogether? If we do the math, 22,000 and 18,000. 40,000 men die, which is a tenth of 400. Mm -hmm. So who pays the tithe? Israel, right? And a tenth, okay, a tenth. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to be a tenth of your produce going to the Levites in order to sustain them and all this. And yet what the Levites exact from Israel is a tenth of your people. They die in war. 
So there's a tenth, there's a tithe that has been given. And what is it that uh, the Old Testament says about the tithe? It says, trust me on this. <laughs> he says, test me on this. If you get, if you will do what you're supposed to do, see if I won't open up the storehouses. You know, see if I won't send you everything that you need. If you will just trust me and test me on this. And so it seems as if God, you know, it's like God shows up in the story, right? And one of the first things he does is he catches them up <laughs> on their tithe, you know, in a gruesome way. But what that implies is that the nation had not been giving God their honor. The nation had not been following the laws that Moses gave them. The nation had not been living in the way that they all knew they were supposed to to live. Remember even Gideon's father in the very early days of this, he secretly wanted to tear down that altar to Baal, but he didn't have the guts to do it because he knew it wasn't right. You know, and Gideon knew it wasn't right either. He didn't argue with the angel when the angel said, "Hey, I want you to tear that down." He's like, "Why?" He did that's not what he said. He's like, "They'll kill me if I do." Right? He was afraid, but he knew it was the right thing to do. They knew Okay? They knew what they were doing was wrong. And, and these people in this story, they know right from wrong, and yet they consistently chose wrong. But again, why the refrain in chapter 18? They didn't have no king. They didn't have no king. You know? And while we do see the implications that this is uh, preparing us for the Davidic kingdom, right? but we also see that you can be God's people, you can come to a, a right relationship with God through, through faith and grace. And, and I've said this in services a lot, that we love the whole Savior thing. You know, and he is that. We love it. I mean, aren't you glad that he's your Savior? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when we start talking about the Lord part, you know, we have misgivings. We might never voice them, right? But there's, a, in the very fiber of our being, is this bent towards doing it my way you know I want to do it my way you're not the boss of me and yet throughout scripture he says yeah I will save you but you are my people I am your king I am your God you do what I say if you do even in in judges and in Joshua he says if you do these things will it not go well with you and yet if you choose not to will it not go poorly <laughs> you know I mean it's very basic it's like how many times as parents have you not said similar things to your old children? We just had the same conversation with Levi this morning. If you would listen to us, then you wouldn't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he's like, I don't like it when you're mad. Well, stop running around and being goofy when you've got five minutes to get out the door, you know? And, and so it's this idea of learning to submit. Oh, that's a dirty word, yeah. right? Especially in our culture today, submission. We don't like that word, but it's part and parcel of the kingdom. You know, it's like, I am your king. I am your Lord. When I say go, you go. When I say stop, you stop. If I say tithe, you tithe. If I say worship, you worship. If I say don't do that, don't do that. Okay? Um, and, and this idea that these people were doing very religious things, all of them but they were only doing what they wanted to do and in their way. They didn't submit to any king. They didn't submit, most of all, to the heavenly king. They didn't submit to God. And that really, if I were to sum up the book of Judges, we see this, hey, yeah, 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 we need you, we need you, we need you, right? We see that cyclical, you know, and then we're just gonna go back to what we were doing in the first place. And what that betrays in their heart is this unwillingness to just do the right thing to just obey to to be obedient to their king god and and they just refused to do it and yet god is merciful <laughs> time and time again he comes to their aid and he sends them uh ultimately he sends them david but even beyond that he sends jesus right to be our redemption uh, to save us from ourselves um, so those people, uh, they, they, they lose a tenth of their men there in uh, verse 
29 then, they set an ambush around Gibeah. This is the, the third day. The people of Israel went up against the people of Benjamin on the third day and set themselves in array against Gibeah as at other times. And the people of Benjamin, of course, they think, oh, we got this, <laughs> okay. Uh, went out against the people and were drawn away from the city as at other times they began to strike and kill some of the people in the highways, one of which goes up to Bethel and the other to Gibeah and in the open country, about 30 men of Israel. So they kill about 30 men. And the people of Benjamin are like, hey, this is we're going to rout them again, just as we did in the beginning. But the people of Israel said, let us flee and draw away from the city to the highways. And all the men of Israel rose up out of that place and set themselves in array at Baal Tamar. And the men of Israel who went in ambush rushed out of their place from Moreh Gabah, and there came against Gibeah 10,000 chosen men out of all of Israel. And the battle was hard, but the Benjamites did not know the disaster was close upon them. And the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel. And the people of Israel destroyed 25,100 Benjamites that day. All of those men who drew the sword so that the people of Benjamin saw that they were defeated. How many Benjamites died? How many are left? <laughs> okay. 900 left. But it doesn't mention the 900. Right? It just, just like the silver, it doesn't mention them. You know? And I'm not saying we need to focus on the 900. But the, the author is saying this 1,100 uh, coins of silver, right? Shekels of silver uh, seemed like a good deal, but it was really used for the wrong thing, and it was bad, bad, bad. These Benjamites, they're part of the tribe of the Lord. Benjamin means son of my right hand, okay? It's such a treasure of mine that, that, that Jacob saw Benjamin as, and yet really, really doesn't go well. They use their resources in the wrong ways, and they do all kinds of bad things, and they're left with 900, okay? Both stories, they're left with 900. Unaccounted for, not mentioned again, those 900, um, but we do figure out what happens with the rest of the men of Benjamin, uh, a few of them anyway. Uh, so uh, the 900 are left, 25,100 men of Benjamin that day, uh, and then verse 36 the middle of verse 36 the men of Israel gave around uh, gave ground to Benjamin because they trusted the men in ambush uh, whom they had set against Gibeah then the men in ambush hurried and rushed against Gibeah and the men in ambush moved out and struck all the city with the edge of the sword now the appointed signal between the men of Israel and the men uh, in the main ambush was that when they made a great cloud of smoke rise up out of the city which is almost the exact same wordy, wordy, wording uh, from the, the battle at Ai. It said, a great cloud of smoke rose up out of the city. Okay? Uh, the men of Israel should turn in battle. Now Benjamin had struck, uh, begun to strike and kill about 30 men of Israel. And they said, surely they are defeated before us in the first battle. So this, what we have here is a retelling in more detail of what you just read. Okay? Uh, but when the signal began to rise out of the city of a column of smoke, the Benjamites looked uh, behind them, and again the whole of the city went up in smoke to heaven. Then the men of Israel turned, and the men of Benjamin were dismayed, for they saw that disaster was close upon them. Therefore, they turned their backs before the men of Israel in the direction of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them. So they're, they're retreating okay, into the wilderness. But they get chased down. And those who came out of the cities were destroying them in their midst. Verse 43. Surrounding the Benjamites, they pursued them and trod them down from Noha as far as opposite Gibeah on the east. 18,000 men of Benjamin fell, all of them men of valor, and they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Ramon. 5,000 men of them were cut down in the highways, and they were pursued hard to Gidon. And 2,000 men of them were struck down, so that all who fell that day of Benjamin were 25,000 men who drew the sword, and all of them men of valor. But 600 turned and fled toward the wilderness, the Rock of Ramon, and remained at the Rock of Ramon for four months. 
And the men of Israel turned back against the people of Benjamin and struck them with the edge of the sword, the city, men and beasts, and all that they found, and all the towns that they found they set on fire. And believe it or not, we're going to press on and do chapter 21 real quick. Now the men of Israel had sworn at Mizpah, no one of us shall give his daughter in marriage. So how many Benjamites are left there hiding in the wilderness? 600. Okay, 600. Uh, we will not give daughters uh, to, in marriage to Benjamin. And the people came to Bethel and sat there till evening before God, and they lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. And they said, O Lord, the God of Israel, why has this thing happened in Israel, that today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel? What are they, they're saying, there's only 600 Benjamites left. It's like we're only going to have 11 tribes now. Because all their women are dead, all their, everybody's dead, there's only 600 men left. And the next day, the people rose early and built there an altar and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the people of Israel said, Which of all the tribes of Israel did not come up in the assembly to the Lord? For they had taken a great oath concerning him who did not come up to the Lord. Uh, he shall surely be put to death. And the people of Israel had compassion for Benjamin, their brother, and said, One tribe is cut off from Israel this day. What shall we do for wives for those that are left? Since we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them any of our daughters for wives. And they said, what one of there was the tribes that did not come up to the Lord at Mizpah? So in other words, who didn't show up for this war? Okay. <laughs> and behold, no one had come up to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were mustered, behold, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So the congregation sent 12,000 of their bravest men uh, there and commanded them, go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword and also the women and the little ones. This is what you shall do. Every male and every woman that was lain with a male, you shall devote to destruction. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man by lying with him. And they brought him to the camp at Shiloh, them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. So they, they kill all the people, the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, and they pull out of there 400 virgins. Right there, running out of space. 400 virgins for the 600 Benjamites. So they find 400 wives for the 600 leftover Benjamites. How many lives are they lacking? 200. 200. Yeah. Okay. So they, they need to find 200 women somewhere. Where do we find them? Um, so here's what was going on. Then the whole congregation sent word to the people of Benjamin who were at the rock. They explain the situation. Skip on down to uh, 16. Then the elders of the congregation said, What should we do for the wives of those who were left? Since the women are destroyed out of Benjamin. And they said, There must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin, that a tribe not be blotted out from Israel. Yet we cannot give them wives for our daughters, for the people of Israel had sworn, Cursed be he who gives a wife to Benjamin. So they said, Behold, there is the yearly feast of the Lord at Shiloh, which is north of Bethel. On the east of the highway, it goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Labona. And they commanded the people of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in ambush in the vineyards, and watch. If the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, then come out of the vineyards and snatch each man his wife from the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. So, in other words, there's some people having church. Yeah. Yeah. They're having a big worship service. Why don't you go there and steal 200 women? Okay? And when their fathers or their brothers come to complain, somebody came in the middle of our worship service and stole 200 of our virgins. We shall say to them, grant them graciously to us because we did not take for each man of them his wife in battle. Neither did you give them to them. So you're, you're good because you didn't give them we took them. They were taken, right? So technically you're observing the law, you know, this oath that we made, um, which is like, huh, it wouldn't have settled well with me if it was one of my daughters that was taken. Uh, so, so you won't be guilty. Verse 23, and the people of Benjamin did so and took their wives according to their number and from the dancers whom they carried off. Then they went and returned to their inheritance 
and rebuilt the towns and lived in them, and the people of Israel departed. From there, at that time, every man to his tribe and family, and they were they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. And what's it say in verse 25? They didn't have no king. <laughs> they didn't have no king. They didn't have a king in Israel. So, isn't it interesting? You see the, um, the 600 three times and, you know, in the tenth of Israel buying and you have... You know, the 600 Benjamites remaining uh, and, you know, 900 unaccounted for with the 900 silver unaccounted for. And you have, uh, uh, you know, the just the slaughter of so many people over this Levite who had so many opportunities to do the right thing, right? Uh, he could have sacrificed himself, but he didn't. He could have left early in the morning on the third day, which would have set into motion maybe a death, burial, and resurrection. But instead, he waits until you know the the, the end of the six, the morning of the sixth day or the fifth day, and uh, and it all goes south after that. But I wanna I wanna remind you that we don't we don't take from this. Oh boy, if you ever see the number six hundred, run away. <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, we do that with numbers, right? You know, like if somebody writes six, 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 oh, you can't do that. You know, can't can't do that. You know, for a long time, I had 666 friends on Facebook, and I kept unfriending people to keep it at 666, just to mess with people. Um, <laughs> but it's not. You know, it's like that number is not a magic number. Okay, it's in scripture because you know, they're trying to tell us something about you know a certain person. You know and a certain message for us but it's not like every time you see that number you need to look for a serpent that's not what those numbers are there for so we have to and we have to do that with the good numbers too you know we talk a lot in this class about the number three in scripture but does that mean that if you're going to buy uh, pieces of property you should only do it in threes no you know there's no sense in that that's not what the scripture is trying to tell you if the third one is not good property, don't buy it, you know? And if there's four and they're really good and you're getting a good deal, buy four. It's okay. You can even buy six, you know? And it's just, oh, well, that's that property line is 666 feet. We better not buy it. You know, that's not what the scripture is trying to tell us, okay? He's trying to talk about our hearts, not, you know, numerology, okay? He's trying to talk about our hearts. And the main message here in the book of Judges, which, by the way, We've just completed. Oh, yeah. No applause. Anyway, um, <laughs> we've just completed the book of Judges. But the main message there is if you consistently choose to do it your way instead of following me, it's not going to go well. You know, and what I'm trying to teach you is, yes, come to me. I am going to shower you with mercy. I'm going to shower you with grace. I'm going to, I'm going to be uh, the one who watches over you and protects you. But here's the trade-off. We don't like this because, well, what about grace? You know, it's like the trade-off is I'm in charge. And why am I in charge? It's not because God is this power-hungry, you know, it's, that's not it. It's because see what happens when you're left to your own devices? When you do it your way, innocent people die. But when you do it my way, you know, I save everybody. That's what, that's my way. So it's not because he's this, this authoritarian party killer. You know, he's not the cosmic killjoy. That's not what submitting to the rule and reign of Christ in our hearts is all about. It is because you can do it your way, and he will let you. He will let you do it your way. But he will have his way because he got his tithe, right? Do you want to do it that way? I said, blessed is the one who casts himself upon the rock. But woe to the one who has to have the rock cast upon him. You don't want it that way. You're going to be broken either way. But do you want to be broken because you threw yourself at Jesus' feet? Or do you want to be broken because that foot come down on your skull? You know, that's not a good way to be broken. It's a, it's a bad way. So, thoughts, questions? You know, the one that I thought was the coolest was the four three two one and that was probably the most tenuous one but <laughs> that was the one i yeah. thought was the coolest <laughs> but oh well
No thoughts, no comments, no questions, no queries. What does Judah mean? Praise. Praise. Praise you. Remember that. It shows up <laughs> all praise. the time. Judah means praise. Okay? Judah means praise. Okay. Thank you. That's the seat. Going to Ruth? Uh, no, no, no. We're not going to go on to Ruth. We are actually going to go back to where we left off before, oh. before COVID. So. Oh.